uh, on why devoting resources to fighting affinity fraud uh, is a priority for you. Well, thank, thank you, Mark, and uh, thanks to Fordham for having us here today for this uh, really important uh, topic. And I want to I want to thank the prior panelists. Uh, we at the SEC, uh, including including me to a great extent, uh, much more than I ever thought when I took this job, um, learn a great deal from talking to people who have been victimized by fraudsters. Um, it informs our priorities, um, and and more importantly, to the question you asked, Mark. Um, if you look at the 43, 4,400 women and men who work at the SEC, it is people like we're just on this panel that they come to work thinking about every day. And that's a reason that retail fraud and affinity fraud in particular has been a focus for me uh, since arriving at the SEC. We have 50 million households in America invested in our markets. And those 50 million homes should know that there's somebody looking out for them. So, you know, you've made protection of retail investors a cornerstone for SEC under your stewardship. Um, can you talk a bit about what the SEC's role is in protecting retail investors against affinity fraud? Well, our, our role in protecting, um, let, me let me start at the top, at a, sort of a top-down perspective on this. Our role is to bring all of the resources and all of the things that we do whether it's in trading in markets, how markets operate, investment management, how investment advisors deal with retail investors, inspections, how we inspect investment advisors and how we oversee FINRA's inspections of broker dealers, and then enforcement to bring all those resources to bear to make sure that we have the fairest opportunities and opportunities that are free from fraud for retail investors. And it's not one thing. It's thinking about all those things and how they work together to make it a better environment for retail investors. And let me give you an example. Um, we heard that uh, people had wished that they had gone to the SEC website. Well, we listened to that. And when we brought forward our new work on standards of conduct, standards of conduct for broker-dealers, clarifying what investment advisors, the obligations they owe, um, we brought forth a new form on two pages, no more than four pages if you're both a broker dealer and investment advisor. You have to tell people how you make your money, what your conflicts are, what they're going to pay. But importantly, you have, to, you have to provide a link to our website that Laurie and her colleagues and others maintain that has direct access to brokers, investment advisors, and their disciplinary history. We want to make it easier for people to identify people they shouldn't be dealing with. And that comes right from listening to stories like we heard today. Another one, um, I see Lara here. We both, and this is where I interject and say, my words are my own. They're not the words of the commission. Uh, but let me tell you, let me I tell you. I actually covered you in a All global right. disclaimer already uh, this well, morning. I'm, I'm about to say something. I, I, here, I have great skepticism. That's the nice way of saying what I'd like to say for self-directed IRAs. They have the veneer of legitimacy. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but they don't have the protections that other retail investments have, and we're looking at that. So um, in June, the SEC announced a Teachers and Military Service Members Initiative, which focuses additional enforcement and investor education resources on behalf of teachers, veterans, active military. Uh, and in fact, we have you know, some members of different associations affiliated with those groups out here today. Um, tell us a little about what the thinking was uh, behind establishing this initiative and why it's a priority. Well, you know, we, we look for places where we can have impact and improve the situation. And if you look at these groups, and, I, and really three groups come to my mind, uh, military, active duty military in particular, but also our veterans community, um, teachers, um, and then the elderly. In, in each of those cases, you have significant communities of people who have a lot in common. Um, they're generally in a position where paying attention to their investments is not easy. Some 
in, in particular in our elderly community, they may have diminished capacity. Our military, you know, they're constantly being deployed and moving, and it's very difficult to keep track. And our and our uh, our educators, they, these are very busy people, who, um, in the case of affinity fraud, are, are look. Let's just face it, teachers are really nice and trusting people. They tend to trust what they're told. We've seen in each of those cases that um, somebody needs to be paying attention for them. And we're bringing our resources to bear to make sure that people are paying attention. As we went out and met in a lot of town halls in connection with our development of standards and conduct, it became clear that in many cases, teachers don't understand the fees they're paying for teacher plans. Those fees are much higher than others are paying. And we want to understand why. Um, active duty military are quite susceptible to affinity fraud. Someone who comes in and says, I'm just like you. I understand the, the, uh, the challenges that you face being overseas, you know, being intermittently involved in your financial affairs. Let me take care of it because I know what you're facing. Well, you know, we all know that when someone says, I'm just like you, but you never really met them before, hold your wallet, <laughs> right? And, you know, our elderly, um, there, there, is, there is a diminished capacity problem. People need somebody looking out for them as they, as they get older. So we recognize all those things, and we're trying to bring our resources to bear as effectively as possible in those areas. And I, and I want to commend the enforcement division. I mean, you guys have been unbelievable establishing the retail strategy task force and, and you know, not waiting, but going out and actively dealing with these issues. So um, we have a terrific group of lawyers and clinical practitioners, teachers, students, community and religious leaders, um, and social justice advocates. Um, did I miss anybody here in all of those groups, by the way? Maybe not. Um, we've got a lot of folks from a lot of different organizations gathered here today. Uh, what would you tell them, what should investors be on the lookout for when someone pitches a new investment to them, and what are the, some of the steps that they can take, um, maybe with some resources that the SEC has? Okay. Who are you dealing with? Yeah. Who are you dealing with? What's their track record? Investor.gov. You'll hear it at least 50 times today. But we are trying to provide an easy way for investors to understand whether they're dealing with somebody who is registered, who is subject to supervision, who is subject to inspection, who has a track record, or whether they're dealing with somebody who's a ghost. Don't deal with a ghost. If you can't find anything about them, don't deal with them. Or somebody who you know, has had a disciplinary problem. Now, I'm, I'm a believer in second chances. But when you see somebody having repeated disciplinary problems, or even, you know, you got to say, I, I need to do more work. I can't. And if they have repeated disciplinary problems, it's too much work. So um, I'm going to open up to questions in just one moment, just maybe one or two more final questions. So, you know, let's say this, this group here has joined us, leaves the program today, and believes that either they or someone in their, um, in their groups um, or their organizations has been targeted by an affinity fraud scheme, um, what should they do? Call us. Contact us. We have a tips, complaints, and referrals program. Um, we get a lot. We want as many as is necessary. Just pick up the phone. It's free. Go on the website. Submit. I would say, Steve's here, Mark, you're here. Um, how, how much of our enforcement activity comes from tips, complaints, and referrals and whistleblowers? What part of the got? We got um, over 20,000 tips, complaints, and referrals last year. Um, we looked at every single one of them within about 72 hours. Um, of those 20,000 tips, complaints, and referrals, over 5,000 of them were whistleblower, purported whistleblower claims. So they comprise, they're a significant source of our, um, we, of our we, enforcement we, investigations. We, we want them. Send them in. Send them in. 
So um, I'll come back to you with any you know thoughts on closing advice in a moment. But let me turn it now to the audience to see if there are questions. And I think we did. He answered my question. Okay. Already. Good. Thanks, Steve. Hi, Mr. Chairman. My name is Sejin Choi, and I'm a 3L at Fordham Law School in Professor Radvani's uh, Securities Arbitration Clinic. Uh, I'm also taking administrative law this semester, and I had a question. Um, when you hear about these unfortunate stories from defrauded investors like the prior panel, um, how much of that shapes your approach to rulemaking under your authority um, as the SEC commissioner? Uh, a tremendous amount. I can tell you that the standards of conduct rulemaking that you know, Laurie and I and a hundred other people at the SEC worked on was substantially informed by these kinds of stories. And not, not what do we do after it happens, but how do we set up our rules so that it doesn't happen in the first place. And that's a, a great deal of what we're getting at, including, this is how you have to think about these things holistically. How can we set up our rules so that when we go and inspect, we have a greater chance of catching somebody who has that veneer of respectability, but actually doesn't? You know, what, what requirements do we put in place for them so that we can go check their internal policies and procedures against what's actually happening? Do they actually have the assets that they say they do, and how can we most effectively check that? I just want to know if what you're doing now is a step up from what was done in the Madoff case, for example, where evidence was brought four times to the SEC and the man was turned away. Is this a new turn? Because the man actually went to the SEC office three times. I forget his name. It's a Greek name. Mm -hmm. um, he said, this cannot be working. This is definitely a fraud. And he was turned down for any follow-up. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is this a new turn for the SEC that we really can go and get some follow-up? Because no, may not should not have happened. So how do we know if it's hollow? Yeah. So um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll say this. Madoff should not have happened. Stanford should not have happened. Um, the, these were widespread. Uh, retail frauds where there was where there were indicia of a problem. Um, what I also can tell you is that those past problems live in the DNA of the SEC's day. There are there's not a person at the SEC who doesn't understand that those should not have happened and that we should pro be approaching our work in a way that they don't happen again. Um, that's sort of the top level DNA um, in terms of day to day, what do we do? The problems in Madoff were um, such that we have changed how we, uh, how we require people to report and what we do to verify those reports in terms of assets held. Um, the problems in Stanford were such that, again, there was the veneer of legitimacy when, in fact, um, the protections that people thought they had did not exist. In, in simple terms, they thought they had the protections that the U.S. law provides them, when in fact they were reliant on Antigua law. Didn't work. Uh, we we know that we adjust our rules, but we need. Let me be. Let me be clear. Fraudsters are clever, and we need to continue to adjust our rules and our approaches um, to keep up with them. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, Robert Smolin, thank you for coming today. I'm a state assemblyman here in New York, and I'd like to hear your thoughts about how we can be proactive in partnering with the federal government, in this case, to prevent community-based financial fraud. This is really important for all of our citizens to have all the tools, but to make sure that they're all integrated at all the various levels of government, because uh, there's no doubt that as technology changes, the frauds will change. And how do we keep up with that, and how can we help in New York State? Yeah. Uh, look, thank you. Thank you for that question and for that perspective. Um, again, trying to bring all the resources to bear that we have 
um, is an important part of what we're trying to do in this regard. And one of the things that we have done in our standards of conduct rulemaking is to require this form for brokers and dealers and investment advisors that says, hey, customer, here's how I make my money, here are my conflicts, here's where to go. So the states, they can use that as well as part of their enforcement program. This is the first time that in a very short, plain language, people have to step up for what they're actually doing. That's, so that, I, to the extent we partner with the states, the states use that as part of their enforcement and inspection mechanisms. I love it. Um, in terms of education, we can do a lot more. As I travel the country, the two most common themes I hear about investing from people are, I wish I knew more earlier, and I wish I, I, wish I knew more earlier, and I wish I started earlier. We, we need to do a better job of educating people not just about investing, but about financial affairs more generally. When you live in a credit-based economy, where you borrow to go to school, where you borrow to, do, borrow to buy a car, you know, you want to transition in your life because you're saving for your own retirement. If you want to transition in your life from a point where you're paying people 8 to 18 percent to where you're making 18, 8 to 18 percent. People need to understand that they need to get their financial affairs sorted, get their high interest rate credit under control, diversify, and invest for the long term. We place a great deal of responsibility on the individual in this country. We owe it to them to educate them about that responsibility. I think we may have time for one more question, and then we'll. Thank you. Um, Chairman Clayton, um, thank you for being with us today. I am um, um, a recent graduate of Fordham Law. I just graduated in May. And um, I'm working in the securities industry now, and I see that um, there's a lot of focus on um, ICOs and um, blockchain and Bitcoin and different cryptocurrencies. And I wanted um, to see if you could talk to us a little bit about what the commission is doing to protect investors um, from this most recent trend. Okay. So let me, let me start with the positive. And I, and I saw something just this morning. Distributed ledger technology, blockchain, um, whatever, you, whatever you want to call it, has great promise to eliminate costs in our financial system. It, that said, anytime there's something new, uh, new and shiny object, it attracts the unsavory types. The ICO market attracted an incredible number of unsavory types. And I cannot thank the women and men of the Securities and Exchange Commission enough for recognizing the threat to retail investors and to our capital market system more generally that that prevalence of fraudsters presented. And they've done a terrific job of weeding those people out while preserving the opportunity for blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology, to provide the promise it has. But the ICO boom was a bust. $4 billion of retail investor money gone. It should be a lesson, and I think it would have been substantially worse without the swift action of the women and men of the SEC. So I. I do want to give you the opportunity, if there's any closing piece of advice or message that you wanted to give this group here um, before, before we close. Look, I think it goes back to those two things I heard. Get started in getting your financial affairs in order early and investing for the long term. Educate yourself. And we provide some tools for that, including, I'll make a personal plug, uh, notes from the chairman. There are short one-minute videos on things like compounding, seeing the signs of fraud, uh, diversification. They're on our website. You'll have to put up with me for five more minutes. But they'll, uh, they'll give you a start on how to think about getting started in investing and, and importantly, um, avoiding fraud.
So I, I just want to thank you for letting me be part of this today, Mark. And I think we might see some of those a little bit later today. Okay. But um, thank you for um, being here. I know events like this are important uh, to you uh, and your vision uh, as chairman. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to take a 15-minute break now, and there's coffee and some at least coffee in the back. <laughs> <laughs>